Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and my guest today is Dr. Jeff Cohen. Jeff is an assistant professor of psychology at Columbia University Medical Center and a digital mental health advisor to startups. His expertise is in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and his work focuses on making evidence-based mental health treatment more accessible using technology. Today, we're talking about digital mental health and the ways it can increase access to mental health care and how digital mental health could help the LGBTQ plus community. Jeff, it's so nice to have you here. Welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Jeff, you know, just in terms of maybe modeling some things too, you wanted to talk a little bit about the pronouns and how we might refer to you in this process. Oh yeah. So I'm Jeff Cohen. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an assistant professor over at Columbia. Very nice. You know, I'm I'm curious what brought you both into the field of psychology, just kind of a little quick two minute drill here, giving us information about yourself. So in the psychology field, and then also with the focuses that you have an interest in and expertise in, and particularly what brought you into digital mental health? Yeah, thank you for asking. So I've been interested in in this field, well, both those fields, psychology and digital mental health for quite a while. So my interest in digital mental health really started in grad school. I was working in a research lab over in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford that was researching the question, can digital mental health apps effectively treat problems like anxiety, depression, eating yeah. disorders? Because the thing is, not everyone can access evidence-based mental health care. No. You know, it can be an insurance issue or I don't know what issues. I'm curious actually to ask you, what issues have you run into in terms of things that get in the way uh, of people accessing evidence-based care? Sure. Access to treatment. There's a number of things. Location, insurance, you know, covered related issues. Uh, Where I live in Hawaii and where I practice, we have a great transference just as a community to mental health, which is very exciting. It's very well accepted. Our insurances prioritize it as well. But access to care is hard sometimes because people are working with a waiting list, particularly with with COVID having been in place, access to care. It's not that people aren't willing to see, you know, folks that are in need, but people are pretty full right now. So having other alternative in, in the meantime, and other alternatives that could be very helpful tend to be beneficial. But those are some of the challenges to entry, the cost, accessibility, location. That's what we find. That's well, what I find too, actually. Just as you outlined, Grant, there's a number of factors that get in the way of people accessing care. And sometimes people can find care, they can find a therapist, but then it turns out a therapist isn't doing evidence-based treatment. Yeah. What do I mean by evidence-based treatment? That just means treatment that we know is supported by research. I think COVID really helped open the public's eyes to yeah. what it means for something to be uh, supported by research, right? Because at the start of COVID, we sort of had people say, oh, maybe you just wave a wand and it goes away, right? right. And we kind of saw it didn't versus something that's actually been researched and actually helps people. So. You know, I'm really passionate about people, you know, getting help that they need and getting help that actually works. And because of all these barriers of accessing care, this idea of how digital mental health could perhaps uh, overcome some of these barriers has been really, you know, inspiring to me. And also, you know, as you pointed out, Graham, this was already a huge issue before the pandemic, but now, you know, it's even a bigger issue, right? We have like a mental health tsunami, right, of need. That's right. I want to talk a little bit in, about some of the evidence-based treatments as we maybe shift later in the talk to, regarding the LGBTQ plus community and some of the ev- evidence-based treatments that you're, as an advisor, making recommendations to startups to include on their platforms. But you know, one of the things about the evidence-based treatments that I like is that folks get a chance to know that these are research-driven, valid, efficacious treatments that they're going to be receiving when they go, you know, sometimes when people say talk therapy, they think it's like, well, I can talk to my friend or I can talk to, you know, somebody else. These are conversations. Yes. And it is talk therapy, but it's backed by research. It's backed by the, you know, these theoretical frameworks that really help people address the core of some of their issues and bring healing to their mental health. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well said. Yeah. So we know that there are, I'm going to refer to digital mental health as DMH just for now. That's a big mouthful if we keep saying yeah, it. Sounds so good. D- DMH, sounds- there are at least maybe a couple of platforms. Could you set a framework for us, kind of a foundation as we talk? What are we referring to when we say digital mental health? What is it actually and how does it work? Yeah, great question. So digital mental health refers to treating or addressing mental health problems with some version of technology. Now, this could be a computer, a phone, a tablet. Of course, there's teletherapy, right? Where you meet with a therapist via video call. That's also part of digital mental health care. 
However, a lot of the barriers that we've talked about, such as wait lists, lack of providers trained in evidence-based treatments. Another thing we didn't talk about was insurance under reimbursement, right? A lot of providers simply can't afford to uh, participate in managed care because the insurance companies reimburse so poorly until we get some legislation, which, which sort of asks those insurance companies to get their reimbursements up. Many, many providers are forced to not participate in managed care, which then means the patients, the clients also have to bear that cost. So all of these things, those can also actually play out with Zoom calls or with yes. video therapy. So I, I think really what I'm going to focus a little bit more on here is automated care, okay. right? Oh, and so automated care, I think really has the potential to overcome some of these barriers and to meet the unmet need. And so let's talk about what automated care is. That's digital mental health apps that are pre-programmed with responses or content. Now these can be mindfulness-based apps that may include things such as meditations like Calm or Headspace. These can also include chatbots like Wobot, which are powered by artificial intelligence or AI. And um, as a full disclosure, I'm on the uh, diversity board over Good at Wobot. You. Good Thank for you. you. Yeah, that's awesome. So give me a sense of, just kind of expand, I guess, understanding of, of the content that I might experience if I go on to an automated DMH app and how it's pre-programmed responses and its content might, let's say, reply to maybe some of my common questions asked as a user or how would I interface with that and what would I experience as a result of being on that platform? Absolutely. So it could be text-based if it's if it's on a, on a smartphone, but essentially it's a chat bot that you can chat with. You know, a psychologist I really, really admire, Dr. Marshall Linehan, who's also the developer of dialectical behavior therapy, said maybe, you know, I think it was over five years ago, she said, I guess she was thinking of Tesla. She said, if we could have self-driving cars, right. we can have self-driving therapy. So that's sort of the idea. We're not fully there yet. But I think we're moving in that direction. As this technology advances, we can have more and more advanced ways of communicating with artificial intelligence in a way that can really be helpful and help people get some of these evidence-based interventions. You know, talking about AI and some of these platforms and and the the back and forth, we're in, inherently saying there's not a there's not a a live body on the other side of this interaction. I don't believe that the therapeutic relationship with a practitioner can never be replaced. And, and I, as I think it's kind of the, kind of the core of the healing process. However, there are some pretty cool solutions that the DMH platforms and what you're talking about right now can add, I think, to the wellness process, particularly people getting started in this process and seeing what it could be like, if nothing else, just in, as a part of their own introspection, be able to ask some questions and watch the responses come back and to learn more about themselves. Talk more about some of the additional things that the DMH can add to the wellness process, even just getting initiated. Absolutely. So, you know, building on what you're saying, I certainly agree that digital mental health is not the answer to every problem. And digital mental health is definitely part of the solution yes. to unmet need and to a way to help folks get care. The thing is, we also need to be sure that users can be connected to higher levels of care. So if they're in crisis, if they're suicidal, and also there's going to be times when in-person treatment would be more helpful. And then we want to try to connect those folks as well to in-person, to your point. That's very cool. You know, we're talking earlier about some, just the trend that started with telehealth, telemental health, you know, teletherapy, basically going online and using, whether it's a Zoom or a FaceTime or we, here in Hawaii, we have some insurance companies that have their own portal, which allows you and I to do a therapy session and see each other face-to-face, -face, you know, via online their online platform. And is it has really provided a very necessary service when everybody was quarantined. And so that was a trend that we saw just really explode. And people really saw that they could have good access to some good mental health during a time of real crisis kind of around the world. So that was a trend that we saw come out of the COVID pandemic that people began to get more used to and see as, again, efficacious and helpful and really provide a need when it wasn't as accessible face-to-face. -face. And I think therapy got more in kind, kind of to, in, into the nooks and crannies of our society where people got access and saw that they could come in and do it. In terms of trends though, in terms regarding the DMH, what are some opportunities that you see as an advisor and, and, and as you're rec making recommendations to startups, what are you seeing some of the trends being that the platforms can be responsive to? So I'd say something that's really interesting is how user-centered design is being utilized here. 
Mm -hmm. The thing is, historically, clinical psychology has operated with this idea of you, if you build it, they will come. Right. A little like uh, Field of Dreams, if you've yeah. ever seen that movie. So, right. right, there's been this idea, if you build it, they will come. It's kind of like a business launching a product without a lot of user testing or feedback. Yeah. So, we know that our mental health treatments work. However, those treatments don't work for everyone and people do drop out. So, the thing is, when we build digital mental health solutions, we want to start with the user before we build the product. So it's not about just translating therapy to take place through an app or similar. It's sort of reworking the process to first focus on the, on the person, the end user, and then build out the solutions from there. Yeah, I, I, I like that. It's a little bit of a, a reverse engineering in some ways. Here's this need. How do, we, how do we support it? And I think it's a really thorough and comprehensive way to say, hey, what are these needs and how do we come alongside you? You know, as we're talking about these trends, I know that part of your expertise, which is in a number of areas, but it includes diversity, equity, inclusion. And in terms of your work to improve the lives of the LGBTQ folks, what are some of the challenges you're seeing in this population regarding access to mental health care that you're hoping that these platforms might help make a bridge? Yeah. So, well, you know how we just talked about the people do drop out of treatments? Yeah. Often these people are from communities that have been minoritized, like LGBTQ people. And part of the reason that people drop out is because the standard mental health treatments do not address the unique challenges faced by minoritized communities. So let me give you an example. Many evidence-based treatments or even many apps, they have content or protocols of what to do when a person comes in with anxiety, but no support around anxiety related to coming out. So if a user inputs that they have anxiety around coming out, that's a question that we want to have an answer to. And so because the platforms aren't adequately addressing the needs and challenges faced by the community, we can see a dip in engagement. Interestingly, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, LGBTQ people are overrepresented in the digital space. So I'd say this is a missed opportunity on multiple levels. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever. But they need support too, to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com slash BHT to register for your free professional account. Again, that's hellotriad.com slash BHT. Come join the community today. Yeah. You're talking about, for example, an anxiety related condition, but maybe some of the evidence-based treatments aren't asking about, is it related to a coming out process? How would you recommend as an advisor, these startups maybe build that part into the assessment and kind of naming that aspect of maybe that's part of the, or maybe the core of the, the anxiety that they're experiencing. How do you, how do you encourage them to build that in? So in a number of ways, I'll give you one example. So if we're talking about invalidation and invalidating environments, which is a hallmark of one of our evidence-based treatments, we want to start to be talking about invalidation on the basis of identity, minority identity. And we want to be able to name that because that can help to shift maybe inaccurate attributions of personal shortcomings that can amplify shame towards the unfair burden of minority stress. So that's one Great. example. And then I think there's a, there's a couple of ways that the DMH can really become a solution for the LGBTQ community. I would love to hear some of those things, please. I'm really excited to talk about this. I'd say there's a couple that, that really come to mind. So like one is a digital safe space okay. and two is about scale. So okay. let me tell you what I mean by these two. So first, digital mental health offers a sort of safe space where an LGBTQ person can come out in a low stakes environment. Put another way, they don't have to verbalize to another human being who might not react well. Coming out can be a stressful experience. And, yeah. and of course, just as a side note, you know, coming out is not necessarily everyone's end goal. However, when it's aligned with someone got and someone's values and something they want to do, we know that it's critical that people encounter an affirming uh, response. So digital mental health can be that safe space, perhaps that first step. 
Now, the next thing that comes to mind is the ability for apps to scale. So digital mental health apps can scale by adding specific cultural content and also more broadly scaling to offer the latest evidence-based treatments. So in terms of cultural content, digital mental health is great in responding to community developments. For instance, uh, news like Elliot Page coming out. While many in the community were ecstatic to welcome El Elliot Pages himself, some folks were activated when the media or people they knew continued to use his dead name. And then when those folks went to in-person therapy, many of them found they had to educate their therapist on who Elliot Page was, et cetera, dead names, before even discussing their own feelings. So with digital mental health, the programmers can develop content that can be rolled out to all users in the app immediately in response to an event like that. Yeah, you know, as I'm thinking right now, you're, you're talking about how some of these folks coming into therapy might be required to kind of educate their therapist. And it's not that the therapist necessarily wouldn't be receptive to or able and willing to embrace treatments around these things. Is there a component maybe where you might help equip and maybe craft some language for these folks to be able to educate others and that comes across for them as an empowerment stance of here's how I get to help others understand some things that they may not understand yet, but could be willing to receive and help me in if they just understood a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that also kind of taps into, into my education hat. Right. I'm also grateful to teach at Columbia. And one of the things that we really try to highlight in education is the responsibility of providers to do their homework. So that includes things like consultation. That includes mm -hmm. things like consulting the literature. That way, when somebody does come in and they have a minoritized identity, the provider's not placing the burden of education on the person themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. You were talking about some new treatments, talked about the safe place and some of the cultural content in this under the scale. Any latest findings or treatments that are accessible here that you might kind of just name for us as we talk? Yeah, so I think just the key thing is that digital mental health can scale to make the latest treatments accessible to people. Yeah, okay. We know that research takes a lot of time and it takes even right. more time to share those practices with therapists, like to, even to the point of our last conversation, you know, I think it's taken a lot of time even for therapists to understand what cultural humility and cultural competence looks like and that the burden's yes. on them for, to do their homework. So yeah. that, that's all part of the dissemination process. And it's, a, right. it's it, it can take decades from the time, you know, a treatment is researched to the time it's actually widely used in clinical practice. So digital mental health can bring those treatments much more quickly to people. Yeah, that's cool. So you're talking even about opportunities here for improvement. We can, we can build upon this and kind of scale these things out. Where are some opportunities that you're seeing continue to present themselves and where we can evolve into? Well, so that's a great question. And I think DMH platforms need to increase the content and the resources for LGBTQ folks. For instance, content that's available when a user discloses their gender or sexual identity. Because right, the thing is not every LGBTQ person is comfortable disclosing their gender or sexual identity with an actual person. Mm -hmm. So typically folks come out to themselves prior to disclosing to another person. And this means that digital mental health can act as an intermediary step for folks who are questioning or looking for support. Unfortunately, I'd say that DMH platforms are failing to create specific resources and content for LGBTQ folks because they're missing a key piece of intel, which I'm about to share with you transparently in the hopes that founders and developers are listening. So right. while LGBTQ people are a small subset of the overall population, a larger portion mm -hmm. of people using digital mental health are LGBTQ. Yeah. So put another way, LGBTQ people are more likely to seek out therapy, and they're also more likely to try digital mental health platforms. Yeah. So honestly, it can be frustrating to see digital mental health platforms that overlook creating content and resources for LGBTQ users because they underestimate just how large a portion of their users that is. Yeah. In communicating that stat right there, that's pretty exciting. This is an opportunity for those that are developing these, these startups to really have some information about where they can focus their content and the ways they come at it. What are you most hopeful as an advisor, as you begin to bring these things to their attention, what are you most hopeful about for the future of these platforms? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that DMH platforms can help to alleviate many of the disparities in terms of LGBTQ health and really increase LGBTQ folks' access to care. Yeah. And I'm so excited about this idea that a couple of colleagues 
of mine, Brian Feinstein and Catherine Fox, we, we wrote up a paper called The Promise of Digital Mental Health for LGBTQ Young People. It's just really a blueprint for how startups can build out content to help LGBTQ people with mental health. So it includes ways that they can attend to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. And maybe I can give even some considerations, tend yeah, to please. DEI considerations broadly. So remembering that DMH is flexible and responds to users, that, that's excellent. So we really need to start to developing content, which addresses issues faced by specific communities. And these can range from, and aren't limited to, but things including police brutality, Asian hate, heterosexism, transphobia. And we really need to start doing the work and move step by step. I realize that we're not going to be able to address every group at once. And there needs to be a plan to build out content one by one to provide culturally sensitive care. You know, sometimes I think people think, oh, well, how will I ever address the needs of every diverse group? And of course, of course, treatments are going to be different for each person. And it's still time to build out culturally sensitive content. Yeah. While I totally get the challenge of this, my overarching point is that we just have to start doing it, building it out brick by brick. Yeah, just one at a time, get it going. Very good. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes it's just good. To, it, yeah, there's, there's a lot of bricks to put in place sometimes when we're doing things like this, but the, the task is to get started is do it the way you're describing. You know, we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community here. And if you were to speak as a teacher, as a clinician in this field at this point, what advice might you have for this group to pursue an affirmative focus therapy, maybe whether for themselves or maybe even for parents to hear this message about? I'd say for the community that when looking for a therapist, it's important to ask about the training the person has undergone to work with LGBTQ folks. A great question to ask, are you familiar with minority stress theory and how that impacts LGBTQ people? Mm -hmm. And just name that real quick. Minority stress theory has to do with the unique stress experienced by different populations or groups. Go another lap on that for us. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So in a nutshell, everybody's got stress, but minority stress refers to the unique stressors mm -hmm. experienced by minoritized people, including LGBTQ people. For instance, one includes the continual process of disclosing versus concealing one's identity. And you'd want the therapist to be familiar with minority stress theory and how to implement it in a clinical context. Yeah, really good. I think that just kind of empowers folks when they begin to take that next step. Are you talking about how the platforms allow for different levels of care to be accessed after that? And so for them to be equipped with maybe some language to try and find the right fit for their therapeutic experience, I think is a, a nice way to uh, encourage them to find out who's going to be a good fit for them. You know, we're kind of winding down on our time today, but I'd love to hear some resources that you might have for the LGBTQ community regarding their mental health. I know there's some projects and some lists out there. Give us some resources you might recommend, even maybe your contact. Absolutely. And if I may, actually, let's also, I'd also just like to speak to everyone more broadly, because I think really when we're thinking about these minoritized communities, we have to think about how people that aren't part of the community can do their share, right? And can do their work. So I want to say one thing that we can all do is start to normalize pronouns. This includes as a cisgender person. So if the only time we're discussing pronouns as a norg is when a transgender person is in the room, we're probably failing at allyship. So I'd say that you want to normalize pronouns by stating them at the start of introductions and email threads, and Zoom names, social media handles, bios. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to require people to, to, to share them, but when you share yours, it models that we're not assuming pronouns, and that's a huge step towards allyship that we can all take. Now, uh -huh. I also want to just say, remember, pronouns are preferred because pronouns are not about who you or someone else prefers to be. They're about who you actually are. So I'd say pronouns is one. Now, maybe speaking um, a little bit more to resources. Okay. So the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy has a wonderful resource called findcbt.org, which is a list of evidence-based providers in the United States and Canada. In terms of LGBTQ specific resources, there's the Trevor Project. There's also WPATH, which has some great resources around the health of gender diverse folks. And I'm also always trying to share resources, so mm -hmm. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Jeff Cohen, and I definitely share 
And then, oh yeah, the paper we mentioned, um, that, that should be out online from American Psychiatric Association. They actually have a whole technology column in psychiatric services. So that's a great resource for digital mental health. I'd also say the Journal of Medical Internet Research is a great uh, research for digital mental health. And then in terms of connecting with me, you know, primarily I'm working with startups and founders mm -hmm. in the DMH space as a consultant. So if you're developing technology in this space and you want to reach out to me, I'd love to connect. You can find me on socials like Twitter or LinkedIn. Outstanding. Well, Jeff, I've really appreciated our time and enjoyed it with you. Thanks for what you're doing, the awareness you're bringing to things in the advisory component that helps folks in their startups. And as they're beginning to put these platforms together, really consider some things that maybe we don't know to consider and to build in in a way that's intentional and meeting the needs of the folks that are willing to come in and do this work. So it's been great to have you with us here today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, it's been mine as well. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Jeff and me today. It's always great to have you with us. I want to remind you that this episode, its resources, and all of our other shows can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT, and explore our archives of podcasts and resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.